The next item of business is portfolio questions, and today it's environment, climate change and land reform. Question number one, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to increase biodiversity in Edinburgh. Rosanna Cunningham. Activity to increase biodiversity at a local level in Edinburgh is primarily led by the City of Edinburgh Council, with support from Scottish Natural Heritage and other partners with whom the Council may have arrangements such as the Edinburgh and Lothian's Green Space Trust. Edinburgh is benefiting from the local delivery of national projects, such as our Biodiversity Challenge Fund, which has provided almost £500,000 this year to three local projects, Bug Life's Bee Lines project, creating a network of special places for nature, the Edinburgh Shoreline project, focusing on coastal wildlife, and the Little Franz Park project, which will breathe new life into an unmanaged urban green space. We also continue to support the Central Scotland Green Network and we grant fund the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. Miles Briggs. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does she agree that green spaces in urban areas are a valuable habitat um, source of biodiversity? Um, and is she aware of the Midmar paddock in the south of Edinburgh, home to many important wildflower species, which has now been repeatedly marketed as a development opportunity, despite being greenbelt, a special landscape area, and designated as open space and a local natural conservation site? I know this is uh, not part of her brief, but is the Minister as responsible for di biodiversity? Um, Will she speak to her ministerial colleagues to make sure the wishes of local residents are considered when these um, protections are being actually put forward? Rosanna um, I thank Miles Briggs for uh, that uh, particular uh, question. Biodiversity um, is a key issue that we have to address in Scotland. Um, climate change, of course, is a key cause of biodiversity loss, but a lot of biodiversity projects will equally help with climate change mitigation or adaptation. Um, and it, it is absolutely crucial that we care for our environment in that sense. There's a lot of very good work being done, it is fair to say, in Edinburgh. Um, I won't test the presiding officer's patience by reading it all out. I'm sure um, I can uh, give, the, uh, give the member uh, a notice of it himself. He's raising a very specific development issue um, uh, with which I am not particularly familiar. I will, however, undertake to uh, check with both my officials um, and with uh, uh, the relevant minister um, about the progress towards this. And, and I presume that the member has also been in direct contact with the council itself. Supplementary from Claire Baker. Uh, thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary give an update on how the Scottish Government is working to tackle non-invasive species, which is a biggest driver of biodiversity loss across Scotland? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, SNH has a programme which uh, uh, um, uh, allocates funding for that. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we have in Scotland is the uh, spread of rhododendron. And uh, anybody who's been in rural Scotland will see that that is, uh, is a very real issue. But they're not the, that's not the only species that is a problem. Um, uh, in principally, the, the landowners ought to be uh, looking uh, very much at what they do on their own land to ensure that they're taking the appropriate actions in respect of this. Um, if, uh, uh, if the member has a very particular thing in mind, uh, she might wish to write to me on, in respect of that. Question number two, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will consider the implementation of Lucy's Law in Scotland in order to ban the selling of puppies by pet shops and other third-party dealers. Marie Goujon. The programme for government announced on the 3rd of September included a commitment to implement Lucy's Law as part of new licensing legislation which will ban the sale of puppies and kittens under six months old by anyone other than the breeder. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Minister for that response. Can the Minister outline uh, what other steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that animals are protected from exploitation and abuse? Marie Goujon. There is a whole host of measures that we're currently undertaking to improve animal welfare in general and I'll just outline some of those and hopefully not test the patience of the presiding officer too much because in addition to introducing Lucy's Law with a modern licensing system for dog, cat and rabbit breeders we are committed to ambitious improvements to animal welfare and as I said there's a number of strands of work underway where we will increase maximum penalties for animal cruelty and wildlife crime in the Animal Health and Welfare Amendment Bill, protect service animals through Lucy's Law, assist permanent rehoming 
farming of at-risk animals, rerun our highly effective awareness campaign on the responsible purchase of young animals, introduce compulsory CCTV recording in slaughterhouses and continue to update guidance on livestock welfare. And this week I also announced the appointment of Professor Cathy Dwyer as the first chair of the Animal Welfare Commission. Uh, and Cath Professor Dwyer has a wealth of experience in animal welfare and recruitment for other members of the Commission will commence shortly to provide expert advice to Scottish Ministers. Question number three, Rachel Hamilton. Government, what action it is taking to promote effective moorland management? Mary Gujar. The Scotland Rural Development Programme 2014 to 2020 supports effective and sustainable management through the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme and that promotes land management practices that protect and enhance Scotland's moorlands. The Scottish Government is providing £14 million for this year for peatland restoration which contributes to effective moorland management and is an important element of our approach to tackling climate change. We have also established an independent group to consider how we can ensure that grouse moor management is environmentally sustainable and compliant with the law. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that answer. Lyme disease is on the rise across Scotland and the bacteria which causes the disease is carried by ticks which live on deer. The deer population is already at its highest level in almost 1,000 years at 1.5 million across the UK. The Moorland Association believes that this points to yet another example of, ben of the benefits of effective moor management. Can I ask the Minister what steps the Scottish Government are taking to control the deer population and will they consider granting more licences under the Deer Scotland Act 1996? Mary I, I thank the member for that question. The sustainable management of deer, uh, which meets the public interest, is of the utmost importance to the Scottish Government. Scottish natural heritage has a statutory responsibility to further the conservation, control and sustainable management of all wild deer species in Scotland. And SNH works with a range of partners, including the Association of Deer Management Groups and local deer management groups throughout Scotland to develop effective planning and management. And Scotland's deer sector is supported through SNH to produce best practices practice guidance on the management of wild deer in Scotland and this provides a range of guidance on effective management with a focus on public safety, food safety and, uh, and deer welfare. But I would also add that SNH has undertaken a review of the progress of deer management in Scotland and they are due to publish those findings shortly and the Scottish Government will consider that report alongside the recommendations from the Independent Deer Working Group which is also due to report later this year and will of course provide a response to that in due course. In relation to the second part of Rachel Hamilton's question, I'd be happy to uh, meet with her to discuss that further and to, to have a further look at that. Question number four, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the impact of including glass in its deposit return scheme in Scotland's glass manufacturers and recycling sector? Rosanna Cunningham. By capturing an estimated 294 million glass bottles each year, DRS will cut carbon emissions by more than 1.2 million tonnes CO2 equivalent over a 25-year period and reduce a common form of litter. It will also make more high-quality glass available for recycling. A high proportion of this is projected to be flint or clear glass, which is in high demand from Scotland's premium drinks industry. Finlay Carson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. In May, you and Macdonald Russell of the Scottish Retail Consortium uh, raised concerns that the inclusion of glass would add an additional £50 million uh, per year in costs, which would end up being paid by the consumer. He said glass is a difficult, bulky and heavy material to manage and will be of enormous burden, especially for those operating from smaller stores. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give me that small stores my constituency will be supported in the rollout of DRS? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I, I know because Finlay Carson is on the relevant committee that he is uh, already actively involved in the process of the deposit return uh, regulations going through Parliament, and that is the right place for uh, a, a lot of the questions around this. I'm conscious that the glass uh, uh, manufacturers and the glass lobby have been very active on this issue. I think I made it clear from the outset uh, that uh, we understood that there were more issues around glass than there are around uh, plastic and aluminium. Um, from our perspective on the Scottish Government side, uh, uh, the issue really is that if we don't include it at this stage, we'll not really be in a position to include it in the future. Therefore, it, this is now the once and for all decision-making uh, time on this. And I would point to the fact that a number of other countries collect glass 
in their deposit return system. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, throughout the process of uh, the deposit return regulations going through Parliament, a lot of the very specific issues raised will be teased out, thought through very carefully. But the, the really big impact, the positive impact that including glass will have on Scotland will also be taken into account. And can I just note in passing that the Scottish Conservatives wanted glass included as well. Supplementary from Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding their deposit return scheme. Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I've met with my counterparts in the UK Government a number of times to discuss deposit return, including timing, uh, and officials have continued this engagement. Um, unfortunately, the recent reshuffle uh, took out the Minister from uh, uh, the DEFRA side that, uh, uh, and I should say she was promoted uh, into another job, but unfortunately there has been a bit of a continuity uh, um, disjunct uh, and I'm still trying to establish who in actual fact will be uh, the new minister. I've been clear that we're open to working with the other nations to ensure compatibility. Um, uh, I've encouraged DEFRA to match our ambitions. Uh, it should be noted that the UK government has yet to commit to introducing DRS and our climate change commitments do mean that it's not an option for us to wait in the hope that others will follow the example we're now setting. Question number five, Liam Kerr. Officer, <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to initiatives in the North East that aim to tackle climate change. Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government is supporting a range of initiatives in the North East that aim to tackle climate change. This includes providing over £10.4 million since 2014 to support the rollout of hydrogen vehicles and infrastructure in the North East, over £5 million since 2010 to support low carbon travel across the region, including increasing the network of publicly available charge points across the region, over £2.1 million since 2013 to 39 renewable energy projects in the North East through the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme and over £9.5 million since 2008 to 115 projects in the North East to help tackle climate change at a community level through the Climate Challenge Fund. Funding has also been provided to support climate change adaptation activities in the North East, including support for Aberdeen ADAPTS, which aims to help the city of Aberdeen to become more resilient to the impacts of climate change by creating its first climate change adaptation strategy and the Dynamic Coast Project, which is developing mitigation, adaptation and resilience plans at a number of super sites, including Montrose. Liam Kerr. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I note the Cabinet Secretary didn't mention carbon capture, utilisation and storage in her answer. So given the UK Government has invested £130 million in research, development and innovation to support to develop CCUS since 2011, is the Cabinet Secretary able to outline what support the Scottish Government has planned to support this technology in the North East? Well, well I think the member knows perfectly well that's a question for a different minister, but can I point out, frankly, it was the UK government pulling the rug out from under carbon exactly. capture in the past <laughs> that put us into the position we're in, and we're nowhere near as far on as we should be. Question number six, Claire Baker. Um, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action being taken to reduce flaring at the Moss Moran Pit chemical plant. Rosanna Cunningham. On 23rd August, SEPA varied the permits of both operators at Moss Morin to ensure there is a clear timetable and detailed plans for implementing improvements to address flaring. This week, ExxonMobil announced £140 million investment at the site, in addition to the £20 million it invests in maintenance each year. Together, these actions should improve compliance and reduce the negative impacts of flaring. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. There have been over 1,400 complaints made to SEPA this year about gas flaring at the plant, including hundreds of people raising concerns over health. While the investment mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary announced by ExxonMobil is welcome, improvements won't be seen for a year and the ground flare is not expected to end until 2024. What discussions is the Cabinet Secretary having with ExxonMobil to push for more immediate improvements? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, well, I don't know whether or not the member was in the chamber last week when uh, Paul Wheelhouse uh, spoke about this. He'd uh, only very recently meet and, uh, meet, uh, met ExxonMobil. Um, a considerable part of their investment is going to go towards improving the efficiency of the plant, as he indicated, uh, including its energy efficiency, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from flaring 
and improving air quality. Um, I think the member will also know that there is a currently ongoing SEPA investigation into all of this. Um, and uh, I think it would be really sensible to allow the environmental regulator to complete that. And then we can come back to the issue in full understanding of the issues that are happening. Can I have short supplementaries, please? Mark Ruskell and then Annabelle Ewing. The current shutdown at Moss Morn was instigated following the failure of two of the three boilers. So is any of the £140 million going towards replacing these boilers? And is there possibly still legal action to follow from the repeated permit breaches that we've seen at the plant? Well, I'm not Rosanna commenting Cunningham. on any possible legal action or otherwise. Uh, I've outlined, as has Paul Wheelhouse previously, uh, that a considerable part of ExxonMobil's money will go uh, towards doing the kinds of things that are needed to do to reduce uh, the frequency and impact of flaring, uh, as well as all of the associated issues um, through uh, noise pollution. And uh, SEPA, as I indicated in my earlier answer, is currently looking very closely at the issue. It is expected to report in November, uh, and I'm sure we will all be back here discussing this when they do. Annabelle Ewing. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, in terms of the welcome investment by Exxon Alliance last week and the 850 jobs attached to that, uh, I understand that the ground flaring design work by Exxon is to be uh, completed apace. Uh, uh, and submitted to SEPA. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could clarify that that is indeed the case and the next step in terms of the best available technique uh, programme. Uh, uh, and also I understand that it, it may be likely from Exxon in my meeting with them recently that the uh, ground flare programme will be advanced and accelerated time-wise. That was hardly a short supplementary. Rosanna no. Cunningham, have you got a short answer? I'm, <laughs> I'm absolutely certain uh, that given the pressure that ExxonMobil is under, that they will be doing their utmost now uh, to reduce the uh, negative criticism that they are receiving. Can I, uh, 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 you know, can I flag up that, uh, um, uh, as indicated, a very significant portion of the money that they're investing will be directed towards precisely the kinds of things that people wish to see fixed. Um, they were, I believe, at some point, told that their original timescales were simply not uh, uh, sufficient. Um, so I'm hoping that we will see uh, real improvements at pace. Question number seven, Jenny Maddock. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in the last year on increasing household recycling rates. Recent, recently published statistics show that Scotland's household waste recycling rate has decreased by 1% between 2017 and 2018. More positively, the same statistics show the amount of household waste generated was at its lowest level since 2011 and fell by 2% compared with 2017. The figures also highlighted positive longer-term progress with a reduction of 1 million tonnes of CO2 from waste since this reporting began in 2011. And for a second year in a row, we recycled or composted more than we threw away to landfill. Jenny Mara. To reduce waste is good news, but the recycling being down is, is bad news. Um, from the figures that the Cabinet Secretary cites, uh, only 36% of household waste in Dundee was recycled last year, and this is sixth from the bottom of all councils in Scotland. I think it's a real shame as Dundee used to lead the way in recycling. So I want to ask the Cabinet Secretary, what is the Scottish Government doing to assist councils with recycling? And given the constrained local government budgets, has the government considered supermarkets who produce so much plastic waste to contribute towards recycling costs? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, we will look at all at any opportunities that there are to, uh, to deal with this. Um, we actively engage with local authorities about recycling and we have set up the Household Recycling Charter in order to encourage local authorities to think about what they were doing um, and to, uh, to bring it all in line uh, with each other. Some local councils have bigger challenges uh, than others in this respect. Um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, Dundee is in that group where there are real issues when you're talking about inner city uh, and, uh, and managing that. Um, but uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, the good work that is being done with the Household Recycling Charter, which we are reviewing uh, over the next uh, uh, year, uh, will pay dividends. Um, the main challenge for Dundee, however, is similar to the main challenge for the centre of Glasgow, the centre of Edinburgh, is the high proportion of multi-occupancy properties such as tenancies. Um, so the, the suggestion that the member has made in respect of wrapping in um, other potential partners in this is a good one. Short supplementary, please, Maurice Golden. 
I uh, refer members to my register of interest. One third of councils have not received grant funding from Zero Waste Scotland for recycling services in the last five years. Does the Cabinet Secretary think this has had an impact on recycling rates? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I would need to uh, um, endeavour to discover from Zero Waste Scotland precisely what the decision-making process was, was in, each, in each of those. And uh, I know from Morris Golden's background, he is probably much more uh, uh, able to uh, enact his informal network of contacts to establish what some of those issues might be. However, I will, uh, if he wishes, undertake to do so on his behalf. Um, I'm sure it will be uh, for particular reasons. Uh, at the moment, I can't go through them all for obvious reasons, um, and I'm happy to engage with that issue further with Zero Waste Scotland. Question number eight, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what role seagrass meadows and similar blue carbon ecosystems play in helping Scotland reach its climate change targets. Rosanna Cunningham. <laughs> Last year, the Scottish Government established the Blue Carbon Forum to better understand the role marine habitats play in mitigating climate change by capturing and storing carbon, but also how they can contribute to climate adaptation. The meeting of climate change targets is measured through the greenhouse gas inventory, which is agreed at a UK level and presently does not include any marine habitats. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has published guidance on accounting for wetlands and the Scottish Government is currently investigating potential data sources and methodologies for estimating net emissions from salt marshes in Scotland. Gail Ross. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Has she seen the Seagrass Ocean Rescue Restoration Project taking place in Wales? And would the Scottish Government welcome such a project in Scotland? Rosanna I'm aware of the Seagrass Ocean Rescue Restoration Project uh, in Wales. Um, I haven't physically seen it, although I am always happy to visit Wales, presiding officer. Um, I am also <laughs> pleased to see pioneering habitat restoration projects in Scotland, such as the Dornoch Environmental Enhancement Project, which is restoring a native oyster bed in the Dornoch Firth, and Seagrass Restoration Scotland, which hopes to begin restoration of seagrass habitats next summer. The Scottish Government is keen to learn from the results of these restoration projects because seagrass is a priority marine feature and is already protected in 26 locations around Scotland by a suite of marine protected areas. The UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration 2021-2030 will also provide a fantastic opportunity for a phase shift in marine restoration. That concludes portfolio questions on the environment, climate change and land reform and we'll move on to the next item of business.